How's it going guys? Welcome back to the channel. I'm an avid herpetologist and today we're going to be revisiting another of my old pet decks. Specifically we're going to be doing a Yu-Gi-Oh deck profile, updating my favorite Yu-Gi-Oh deck of all time, Paleozoics. Now I have not done too many Yu-Gi-Oh deck profiles here on the channel because I mean, quite frankly, Yu-Gi-Oh deck profiles are exhausting. They have a lot more text to cover over than uh, your typical Digimon or even Magic the Gathering deck. But I do want to cover my Paleozoic deck because this is a deck I have been on and maining really as long as the Paleozoics have been around. In fact, even though I have not done too many Yu-Gi-Oh videos here on the channel, my Paleozoic deck profile is actually one of my best performing videos of all time, which really just warms my heart. I absolutely adore this deck and I love that other people want to enjoy the deck as well. So I'm here to actually update my list because since I made that deck profile, Paleozoics have picked up a ton of really, really valuable support. So I want to kind of go over my current list with the new format. Now this is going to be post the August 2024 ban list. So we've just seen uh, Fiendsmith Snake Eyes take some pretty severe hits. Although one of the cards that we noticed did not get hit is Dimension Shifter. Now, Dimension Shifter is going to be the elephant in the room while I'm going over this deck profile because yes, this deck has a very difficult time playing through Dimension Shifter. But uh, I mean, to be fair, a lot of different decks have difficulty playing through Dimension Shifter these days. So like, you know, it is what it is. Paleozoics is still a very brutal control deck if you're actually able to get things online. And if your opponent does not have Dimensional Shifter, Quite frankly, they're probably going to have a hard time getting through a lot of the interaction that we're able to run at this point. So I'm going to be going over my deck. Uh, the title is not clickbait. We are playing a total of 39 traps and three non-traps. So it is total a 42 card deck profile. 39 of them are traps. And then we'll talk about the other three cards at the very end. So let's go ahead and get into the deck profile for today. We've got a lot to talk about. And uh, well, that's why you guys are here, right? Let's get into it. Hang on just a second, guys, before we get into it. If you are interested in picking up any of the cards that you're going to see featured in today's video, you can now do so using my TCG Player affiliate link, which can be found in the description of all of my videos moving forward. By following the link in the description below, you'll be redirected to the TCG Player website, where you are free to purchase all of the cards that you are going to buy anyway, with no additional charge to you. But just by following my link, they'll know that I redirected a little bit of traffic to their website, which means I'll be making a commission off of every card that you buy. Bye. If you're looking for a way to financially support the channel, again, without spending any additional money, just remember to follow my TCG Player affiliate link in the description below, buy the cards you are going to buy anyways, and you'll be helping support me while getting to continue enjoying the hobbies that we all share together. Thank you all so much for your support, and with all that out of the way, let's get into the video. All right, let's go ahead and get started. So before we even talk about any of the Paleozoic cards themselves, we have to talk about the most important addition to the deck, and that is three copies of Transaction Rollback. Now, Paleozoics are very much a trap archetype, obviously, and Transaction Rollback is one of the newest, most busted pieces of generic trap support we have gotten in a long, long time. So basically, when you activate this card while it's in play, you pay half your life points, target a trap in your opponent's graveyard, and use that card's on activation effect. Now, obviously, there aren't too many generic trap cards floating around the format, Generally speaking, you're going to want to try to get this into your graveyard either by milling it, discarding it, or something of that nature. However, do keep in mind that there are at least a couple of generic traps that this card is able to copy. Think things like Infinite and Permanence, which may not necessarily be worth half your life points, but there are going to be circumstances where it is worth that cost. So do make sure that you keep that in mind. But yeah, generally speaking, this is a card you're going to want to try to pitch to like Dynamiscus. You're going to want to mill off of your Needlebug Nests. It's not something you generally want to see in your hand, but if you do have it in your hand, there are actually quite a few ways that we can still get this into the graveyard without having to set it. But the more important part of Transaction Rollback's effect is easily the second effect, which is the graveyard effect. While this card is in your graveyard, you can banish it to target a normal trap in your graveyard once per turn. Hard once per turn, mind you, um, and you get to, again, copy that traps on activation effect. You're skipping any cost that you would pay and just copy the ability. Basically, this is going to give us the opportunity to make plays even out of our graveyard. It basically lets us turbo mill through our deck, and we don't have to worry about important cards hidden in the graveyard because we can still recycle those powerful effects. It basically makes Needlebook Nest, as well as cards like Paleozoic Morella, some of the most powerful in the deck, since we can get this into our graveyard super quick, and we immediately have access to interaction. So, Transaction Rollback is... Like I said, it's kind of like the new centerpiece for the deck, deck itself. It's a card you really can't afford to run less than three copies of, and you will abuse the absolute crap out of this in this particular list and really any paleo list that you're going to be running. But since we are playing a pure trap deck, obviously, 
If we're doing a needle bug nest and flipping it up, we want to probably be milling a total of five trap cards, hopefully hit a rollback and have four other options that we can now have access to. Speaking of milling cards, we'll go ahead and talk about our Paleozoics, the pride and joy of the deck. I've mentioned briefly in my uh, original Paleozoic deck profile, I love these cards because they are extremely flavorful. All of the Paleozoic cards, both the traps and the XEs monsters, are named after real world arthropods. So like if you were to look these names up, you would actually find real prehistoric animals, which is where the name Paleozoic comes from. And they kept the names, the official scientific names, despite the translations, changing them from Bergostomas to Paleozoics. Basically, all of the Paleozoic traps share a trait in common. If a trap card is activated at any point, you can chain this from your graveyard to summon itself as a level 2 monster that is an aqua type, normal monster with 1200 attack and 0 defense points, with an additional effect that makes these guys immune to monster effects. That's the important part, and that's one of the things that kind of sets Paleozoics apart from your other trap archetypes. Think decks like Eldlich or Labyrinth, which are both debatably more popular than Paleozoics, you know, depending on the time period. But each of the Paleozoics, as I mentioned, shares that effect where they can summon themselves, and they each have an additional, just inherent trap effect that you'll activate anytime you, of course, are using the trap cards. Starting with Morella, it lets you send any trap card from your deck to the graveyard. This card went from a generically very powerful starter to one of the best cards in the entire deck, again, thanks to Transaction Rollback. Not only can it send rollback itself, but it also lets you send any key piece of interaction you need at a moment's notice, which is super, super strong. So Morella went from a good early turn card to one of the best cards to see, whether it's early, mid, or late game. So Morella is still going to be one of the best cards, and I am still going to be playing three copies of Pykea alongside it. These two are your general primary startup Paleozoic cards. Pykea's effect lets you discard a Paleozoic Trap to draw two additional cards. So not only are you, of course, setting up your graveyard with two Paleozoic Bodies to summon back, which is perfect for our second turn Opabinia play, which is usually what I try to go for, but it's also, of course, going to provide you with two fresh cards that you can then set on your follow-up turn. So Pykea is, I think, my favorite startup card, just because, like I said, it does replace itself while also setting up additional Paleozoic Bodies. But yeah, so these are going to be your two primary startup Paleozoics, but we also have plenty of interaction as well. I'm going to be playing three copies of Paleozoic Canadia. Canadia is a Book of Moon effect to set a card face down. Super, super helpful. Really good for helping to stop opponent rotations if you know the proper choke points. We also have three copies of Paleozoic Dynamiscus. This card lets you discard a card to banish any face-up card on the field. It's a Karma Cut, which is a fantastic way of getting a transaction rollback from our hand into our graveyard. We have three copies of Paleozoic Alanoids. Alanoids is a Dust Tornado that lets you destroy a spell or trap, which obviously not every deck is going to be playing a ton of, but there are quite a few valuable cards that you can hit with this right now. And finally, we are wrapping it up with two additional cards, two copies of Paleozoic Linchoilia. Linchoilia lets you target any banished card and return it to its owner's graveyard. Needless to say, this is a new addition because this card plays fantastically with Transaction Rollback. Now, all counted, that's going to be a total of 17 Paleozoic Bodies. That's going to be plenty of ways that we can load our graveyard up with these cards and then bring them back so we can make our powerful follow-up Xyz plays. Uh, so yeah, that's going to do it for our Paleozoic Bodies. Now we're going to get into our Toolbox. The Trap Toolbox is my favorite part of the deck. So we have, of course, our first three of, and that's going to be Trap Trick. Trap Trick, much like Morella, is obviously going to be tutoring us any of our valuable interactive pieces. Trap Trick is also super valuable because it is ultimately representing two different trap activations, obviously the initial activation of Trap Trick and the follow-up trap as well, meaning on an empty board, Trap Trick does provide us with a total of two activations and therefore two Paleozoic bodies. We're going to want to be making Paleozoic Opabinia pretty consistently on our second turn. Trap Trick can do that on its own. Trap Trick is also kind of interesting in the sense that Transaction Rollback can actually target this in order to put the trap that we want to be touching with Transaction Rollback. If we don't already have it in our graveyard, we can target a Trap Trick, set the card to our field and still be able to activate it while also getting a Paleozoic activation on top of it. So. There are honestly some pretty intricate ways we can use transaction rollbacks to interact with and kind of expand our game plan. Um, but Trap Trick is by far one of the most valuable cards in the deck, just obviously for the sheer utility of it, and it's something you will want to see in your opening hand as often as possible. Next, we're going to talk about our other startup trap, which is, of course, three copies of Needlebug Nest. I was running two in my last profile because 
As I mentioned, uh, transaction rollback didn't exist at that point, and there were plenty of cards we didn't want to necessarily be milling right away. We couldn't really rely on our graveyard quite as well. Now, setting up the graveyard with Paleos has always been super helpful, but now that transaction rollback exists, and we can immediately make a play off of that, Needleblood Nest can potentially be any of the traps that it's milling. So, super, super valuable, milling five right off the bat and getting our guard loaded up with Paleo bodies. Very, very good. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about our protective traps. Now, these are the traps that are hopefully going to keep our Paleozoic bodies safe until the turn comes back to us, starting with three copies of Threatening Roar. Now, Threatening Roar makes it so your opponent cannot declare an attack. And on my last video, I had a lot of questions about why Threatening Roar versus something like Waboku or Aegis of the Ocean Dragon Lord. Very important distinction is Threatening Roar makes it so your opponent cannot declare an attack while the other two can. Threatening Roar, unlike Aegis of the Ocean Dragon Lord, will still leave your Paleos open to spell and trap removal. So things like Lightning Storm, Rageki, Dark Hole, those are still things you have to kind of be aware of. But in my opinion, the more common scenario we want to try to prevent is our opponents getting valuable on attack triggers. Think things like the Kashtira cards. If we have a Waboku or an Aegis of the Ocean Dragon Lord in play, they can still attack with their Cash Tira cards and get the activations, which, you know, sometimes may not matter too much since we're immune to monster effects. Obviously, we don't have to worry about Fenrir, but I am pretty worried about cards like Unicorn and Ogre, which can exile cards that I may need. So, Threatening Roar is going to basically be the best chokehold protection card for our opponent. Since they can't swing over our tiny bodies, and they are immune to monster effects, if they can't out them through spell and trap removal, it pretty much guarantees we're going to keep our bodies into the next turn. So, Threatening Roar is, again, just one of those cards that I always love to see in my opening hand when possible. And being able to rinse and repeat this card, thanks to Transaction Rollback, it's disgusting. So, super, super helpful. This card has not gone below three in any of my Paleozoic lists. And we are playing another brand new card with Destructive Daruma Karma Cannon at three copies. This card sets all monsters on the field to face down defense position, then forces both players to send any remaining face up monsters to the graveyard. This is going to get around potential tower effects, while also, again, protecting our board from potentially getting wiped if we can activate this during the battle phase. This is fantastic as a card that can help stop decks like Tenpai Dragons and their big, but you know, battle phase shenanigans. So both of these cards are going to help make sure that any of the bodies that we are summoning out, any of our Paleozoics, survive to our turn so we can make our follow-up plays. Now, one of the important interactions we need to make sure we understand with Destructive Daruma Karma Cannon is how it interacts with our Paleozoic bodies since they are not inherently monsters. The Paleozoic traps specify that when they summon themselves, they are no longer considered trap cards. Now, generally speaking, the way that trap monsters work, if they are set back down while they are considered a monster, they actually have to return to your spell and trap card zone. Not true for the Paleozoics. Since they are not considered trap cards when they set face down, they're going to actually maintain and remember that they are level 2, 1200 attack, normal monsters. However, there is something that does happen to them when they get set, and that's losing their monster effect immunity. So basically, if I have, for instance, Dynamiscus and Canadia in play, activate Karma Cannon, I'll of course be able to summon a third Paleozoic if I have access to it, then all three of those cards will get set face down. Now, they're still going to be considered the monsters that they are when you flip them back up, but even after you flip them back up, they lose the inherent traits that were given to them by the original trap effect that summoned them. So, they lose the monster immunity, and also importantly, they will not get banished if they get removed from the field. That's one of the other stipulations that all Paleozoics have. If they, after summoned, would leave the field, they get banished instead of going to wherever they would normally go. If you set them off of Karma Cannon, both of those stipulations are gone, they are just considered monsters and can be interacted with completely normal, which can be both a positive and a, uh, a negative. You know, like if your opponent can interact with them once they've been set, obviously that's not a great thing, but it is also kind of helpful where if your opponent is about to wipe, for instance, let's say you summon a couple of Paleozoics and they go to Raigeki you, you can chain Karma Cannon to set them all face down and make sure you're not losing all of that card advantage. So you can keep your Paleozoics in the graveyard where they can hopefully be brought back on the next turn once you've had a chance to get a few more traps going. <clears throat> so it is a very powerful card. Uh, make sure you know how all of the interactions work um, with your Paleozoic cards, but super, super strong and I am going to be playing three copies. All right, home stretch. we got a couple more interactive traps that we're going to be using, again, to just add to our toolbox, starting with two copies of Ice Dragon's Prison. 
This card is either the best trap in the deck or the worst trap in the deck, depending on the format. If there's a lot of decks in the meta that are using same type monsters, this card is incredible. It's actually very good against decks like, you know, Snake Eyes, fantastic against Ubel. So this is one of the better cards in the deck, and I'm actually siding a third copy just because it is so backbreaking in the matchups where it's good. It is like really good. I'm also still playing two copies of Terrors of the Overroot. Now, if you haven't seen this card before, it targets any card your opponents control and a card in their graveyard, and then it's going to send the card from the field to the graveyard and set the card from their graveyard to the field. So it's basically just pulling a switcheroo, moving, removing a card from your opponent's graveyard, putting it in play, and sending a card they control to the graveyard. This is one of the most versatile trap cards since it can be used for removal on anything in play. It sends instead of destroying, which is obviously going to be helpful in plenty of scenarios, especially with cards like, for instance, Unchained running around in the meta. And it's also a way to kind of counteract graveyard plays, where you can set a card from your opponent's graveyard to their field, where ideally they're not going to be able to use it. If you hit a monster from their graveyard and set it, chances are they're not going to be able to use it unless you're playing against, you know, an opponent with like a fusion strategy, but... Obviously, in those cases, you just kind of play to the best of your ability. You can always set things like Ash Blossoms or any hand traps they've used. Basically, just give them a useless body at the cost of whatever you need to get rid of off the board. So, super, super nice to have. Definitely worth the inclusion. We have a little bit more spell and trap removal with Heavy Storm Duster. It's a two for one, letting you basically hit two of your opponent's cards at the cost of your battle phase during that turn, which, if you're using it on the opponent's turn, has no downside at all. Straight value, just a two for one. And the last card we're going to be using, the last 39th trap, is Elemental Burst. Now, if you've been keeping up with any transaction rollback lists online, you may see this card and some other kind of unusual cards floating around, and that's because despite having a very steep activation cost, it didn't contribute a monster of each elemental type, earth, wind, water, and fire, in order to use the effect. Transaction rollback bypasses that and just lets you use the activation effect, which in this case lets you destroy all cards on your opponent's field. Just all spells and traps, all monsters, gone. Obviously, there are certain decks where you have to be careful. Again, decks like Ubel that want their cards destroyed. You gotta be a little bit cautious with how you use this, but even still, the chance to wipe not only our opponent's monsters off the board, but also their spell and traps, it can be really helpful to give us a good advantageous position. And if we ever happen to, let's say we open a Needlebug Nest and a Paleozoic Morella, if we use our Needlebug Nest and mill the rollback, we can always use our Morella to send Elemental Burst and have immediate access to that backbreaking effect right away. It is very much kind of that techie one-off card that's basically just there for the blowout turn when it comes up, but it's not something we really rely on. And again, obviously we have lots of different ways that we can get it into the graveyard if we need to. All right, that's all 39 traps. We, as I mentioned, we do still have three additional cards. The next one is actually the newest addition to the deck, and that is two copies of Magicoloidal Soul. Magicoloidal Soul is a level two Aqua Tuner monster with 400 attack and 300 defense. If a monster is special summoned by a trap effect, you can special summon this card from your hand or graveyard, but if it's summoned from the graveyard, much like Paleozoic, it will banish itself if it leaves the field. During the opponent's battle phase, hard once per turn, you can use this card to either immediately XE summon or synchro summon. Now, there is a very important card that this is able to make, one that you're probably already thinking about, and that is totally awesome. Now, obviously, we're going to be talking about our Xyz monsters here in a minute, but the fact that this can basically go into a totally awesome on our opponent's turn, even after we've used a totally awesome effect, is pretty cool. I actually love this card. Like, this is basically just straight Paleozoic support. It may not technically be Paleozoic support, but as far as I'm concerned, this is an honorary Paleozoic card. This card is fantastic. It's still water attribute, which is going to give it some nice synergies with some of our other Xyz monsters. And to find our Magicoloidal Souls, I'm also playing our one allowed copy of Reasoning. Reasoning is going to make our opponent declare a level. We then reveal cards until we hit a monster that can be special summoned. If it's the level they declared, it goes to the graveyard. If not, we get to summon it for free. And all of the cards in between go to the graveyard. Since we are only playing two monsters, hopefully we will be milling quite a bit off of our initial reasoning. Reasoning set four is probably the scariest startup play that this deck can make, since obviously it's pretty sure that we're going to be milling copies of our transaction rollbacks off of reasoning with plenty of potential targets uh, for interaction as well. So reasoning is fantastic and obviously the only monster target that we have 
we don't care if it goes to the graveyard or hits the field. We're, as long as we see it, we get access to it and can immediately make use of it on the follow-up turn. So one copy of Reasoning because that's currently what is allowed. And as much as I like Reasoning, really do hope that this card does not go above one in the TCG. I know it's above that in like Master Duel, but even still, I feel like this card is going to get abused pretty heavily if it goes back to three. So let's just leave it at one. We'll make use of our single copy and we've got our two monsters to summon off of it. And that, that is going to do it for our main deck. We'll go ahead and clean up here and we'll start talking about our extra deck. Alrighty, so obviously Paleozoics are a rank 2 toolbox deck. We do have quite a few different ones to make use of here. Starting off, we are going to be playing a full 3 copies of both of the Paleozoic Xyz cards, starting with Anomalocaris. Anomalocaris has an effect where if it has a trap card as material, you can detach a material once per turn, either player's turn, to destroy any card on the field. Now, Anomalocaris' secondary effect makes it so anytime a trap card goes from your spell and trap zone to the graveyard once per turn on either turn you're going to excavate the top card of your deck if that card is a trap it goes to your hand otherwise send it to the graveyard obviously with 39 trap cards we're almost always going to basically be drawing a card anytime we activate our first trap for the turn so Anomalocaris is fantastic for late game and mid game making sure that our tempo stays consistent we activate a trap in response to what our opponent is doing get our new body halt our, hopefully stop our opponent's plays then we get another card to replace it immediately and if we're doing this on both turns obviously we're drawing two each turn cycle off of this now both the removal and the excavate effect are soft once per turns meaning if you have more than one Anomalocaris in play you'll get to use each of those effects once per Anomalocaris. So you'll get to potentially excavate two cards when a trap goes to the graveyard and you can remove two things from the field. So fantastic interactive card. This is a great card to make off of Magic Colloidal Soul for obvious reasons, not only because it's immediate interaction with having uh, monster effect immunity, just like all Paleozoics have, but again, it's going to have that ability to immediately keep our tempo going. Now the other Paleozoic Xyz monster is Paleozoic Opabinia. Obabinia takes two materials instead of three, meaning it's usually going to be the very first follow-up play I make on my second turn. It still, of course, has the Paleozoic monster effect immunity, and if it has a trap card as material, once per turn, on a hard once per turn, you can detach a material to add any Paleozoic trap you want from your deck to your hand. This card has gotten even more powerful now, since again, Paleozoic Morella and now Lean Choilia are able to play and interact with our transaction rollbacks, so not only can we make simple plays like, you know, grabbing our Pikeas if we want to do our trade-in effect to draw two cards, our Canadias if we need to set something, our Spell and Trap removal, we can also just straight up grab Paleozoic Morella, send Transaction Rollback to the graveyard, then use any of the effects we already have access to. So, Opabinia and Anomalocaris are very much the heart and soul of the deck. These are the primary extra deck plays that I tend to make while I am working on controlling the board state. Opabinia I tend to make first, Anomalocara second, just because again, Opabinia lets you immediately add another trap from your deck to your hand, keeps your tempo going, if you protect it until the next turn, do it again, and more than likely make Anomalocaris on turn 3. Now we go ahead and get into our Xyz toolbox, we do have our copy of Totally Awesome for that nice Omni Negate. This card is easy to make with our Magicaloidal Souls, but remember it is only makeable that way during the battle phase. More than likely, if you're making this with Soul, it's going to be after activating something like Threatening Roar, where you can summon out both of your bodies, make Totally Awesome so they can't swing over it, then you now have a free Omni Negate on your opponent's second main phase, which you can do whatever you want with. We are still playing a copy of Gigantic Sprite. This will let us grab our Magical Little Souls from our decks, while also being a 32 base attacker if we make it with a Link Monster material. This is also helpful since we have our cards like Cat Shark, which can double the base attack of some of our Xyz monsters. And since Gigantic Sprite states that its base attack is what becomes doubled, it will double from 3200 to 64 if you use Cat Shark. Cat Shark also has an effect where it is immune to destruction by battle while it has a water monster equipped as material, meaning that, again, if we make this with Magicoloidal Slime, you're basically saving yourself for that battle phase. You can summon a Paleozoic, Magicoloidal, Effect Overlay, make Cat Shark, now they can't swing over it in battle, so as long as it's a safe play, as long as they don't have piercing or a way to out it during the battle phase, easy way to wall up for that turn. We also have the Closer in the form of Digusto Phoenix, another great target for our Cat Shark's attack point double effect, in which case it will be able to detach a material, target a face-up wind monster I control, that monster can then attack twice. So basically the idea is if the opponent's board is empty, we can double this from 15 to 3000, let it attack twice, and now it presents 6000 points of damage, which is going to help us close the game out 
faster than you can blink. Um, super, super great card. Obviously, Paleozoics being a control deck, we do need a way to close the game out when necessary, and Digusto Phoenix does that job excellently. The last Xyz card we are playing is our Super Star Slayer Typhon Sky Crisis. Oh my goodness, I can't, I can't with these names. <laughs> Now this card has had its stock go down a little bit since the last couple of lists. Since we no longer have to worry about 3200 attack Apollosas, we're not worried about Barone anymore, Barlode Savage Dragon, but there are still plenty of cards that this is a hard stop to. Uh, one of the big ones a lot of people will talk about is Nibiru. Uh, it is worth mentioning that because Nibiru is a monster effect and does not tribute for cost, your Paleozoic cards are actually immune to Nibiru already, so it's not really a hand trap this deck like really struggles with necessarily, but there are still plenty of relevant extra deck cards, and even some main deck ones, like, you know, Snake Eyes Flame Bird's Dragon, that Typhon is able to shut down since anything with 3000 attack or more cannot activate its effects. If you're only able to summon a single body or only keep a body in play, this is usually your good follow-up turn that will at least give you a 2900 beater that you can try to do something with while you work on setting back up. All right, now we are playing a couple of Link Monsters. Starting off, we have Paleozoic Cambro Raster. Cambro Raster, again, Paleozoic card. It is immune to monster effects, and it also lets you target a face-down Speller Trap on the field, send it to the graveyard, and then immediately set a Paleozoic Trap from your deck to your field. Now, this does require two Paleozoic monsters in order to summon, which can be a little bit messy, just because our Paleozoics will naturally be banishing themselves if they leave the field once they're summoned, but as we've already talked about, if you, for instance, are setting an entire field with a Karmic Cannon, you can then flip the Paleos back up, make Canberra Raster without having to actually lose them permanently, and this is a fantastic card where if during the late game we happen to top deck a transaction rollback, we can set it, make Canberra Raster, target our transaction rollback, set it to the graveyard for free interaction, and still get a follow-up Paleozoic on top of it. So, Camber Raster is a pretty nice card. Um, it's generally something you're going to want to make, like, mid to late game. It's definitely not an early game card, just because the materials can be pretty restrictive in the early turns. Next up, uh, unfortunately, Sprite Elf is banned. I say unfortunately, but realistically, it's good. But, anywho, uh, since we don't have Sprite Elf, we are now playing our copy of Sprite Sprint. Sprite Sprint is not a perfect substitution for Sprite Elf, but it can at least send our Magical Little Slime from the deck to the graveyard, where we can then obviously summon it back on the next turn and just kind of, you know, go from there. Its effect to detach materials in order to bounce things is definitely nice. Sprite Sprint, again, not a, you know, perfectly fantastic card, but at the very least, it is, you know, serviceable for a level 2 centric archetype. Next up, we of course have our copy of IP Mascarena. This is obviously generally going to be the second Link monster that we want to make behind our Sprite Sprint or Paleozoic Cambro Raster. So we can get our value off of both of these, make our Mascarena, and then we immediately have the option of going into something much more powerful. And the target that we're going to be using is still Topologic Bomber Dragon. Bomber Dragon has an effect where anytime a monster is summoned to one of its arrows and it has a facing up and three downward arrows. Anytime you summon one of those, it's basically a dark hole on the board. It destroys all monsters in the main monster zones. Now, this is such a backbreaking card and is the boss monster of choice for Paleozoics because naturally they are immune to monster effects. So if we establish our topologic bomber dragon, especially with Mascarena, so it's immune to destruction by card effects, we, anytime we activate a trap, we can summon any Paleozoic body out of our graveyard, summon it to one of the arrows, and it basically gives us three free one-sided board wipes on that turn. So Topologic Bomber is a card that I do use every once in a while. If I'm in a position where I can make it, I'll usually try to, just because it is so hard for our opponents to play through it. And of course, it still has that Armory Arm effect, where if it beats something in battle, you can inflict damage to your opponent equal to the attack of the destroyed monster, which again, nice for helping to close games out. But uh, yeah, that is going to about do it, guys. Now, I could go over the side deck, but as you guys probably already know, the sideboard changes way more frequently than the main and extra decks, just because obviously that's going to have to adapt to whatever given circumstances that we're in. There are obviously plenty of cards that you could use in your side deck. There are plenty of floodgates that Paleozoics play well under. There are plenty of cards that you can add third copies of, like Heavy Storm Duster and Ice Dragon's Prison, which may be a little bit more situational. But yeah, that's going to about do it for the Paleozoic deck. I actually think these guys are pretty well positioned in the meta right now, outside of, of course, Dimension Shifter. I mentioned at the top of the video, this deck is very difficult to play under Dimension Shifter, but we also have a lot of stall tools, so hopefully if our opponent shifters us, we can just set some back row, let the turn pass, and just kind of go from there. Um, 
The decks that are going to be playing Shifter, this deck does at least have a pretty decent matchup into. Decks like Tenpai are going to have a pretty difficult time breaking through all of our battle phase interaction. And that's going to about do it. I don't really have too much else to say, guys. Thank you for joining me for another deck profile. I hope you guys have a fantastic rest of your day, and I will see you all next time.